everyone. Welcome to Life Mastery TV, your source for inspiration, empowerment, and fulfillment. My name is David McLeod, and I am your Life Mastery Coach and author of the book, A Life to Die For. This is episode 171, and the title today is Cancer's Unexpected Gift. That seems like an odd title, given that cancer is usually a very scary diagnosis for people. And sadly, far too many people in our world seem to find themselves in a position where they have to deal with that kind of diagnosis. If you're struggling with something as serious as cancer, then of course, you want to do everything in your power to mitigate or eliminate the disease as rapidly and as pain painlessly as possible. But is there more you can do? Sometimes, as we'll learn in today's episode of Life Mastery TV, your healing and recovery hinges on one vital ingredient, your attitude. Hmm. In fact, this may well turn out to be the most important ingredient of all because your healing depends upon the kind of energy you invite into your situation. Now, to help me with this discussion, I've invited a genuine emissary of joy to join me. My guest is a best-selling author, a speaker, teacher, certified angel card reader, blogger, military mom, and yes, a pancreatic cancer survivor. She assists people in owning and embracing their divinity and living a life of love, joy, peace, and ease. Her book series, On a Path of Joy, provides daily devotionals to help set your day's tone. So please welcome my colleague and my friend to the show, the delightful Jeanette Stewart. Okay, come on, Jeanette. I know you can turn, turn on your camera. <laughs> Here we go. It went back to the, are you selecting the high yeah, definition? Yeah, there you go. Hi, everyone. Well, anyway, you're here. Welcome. I'm thrilled to have you here today. I know that uh, we're going to have a real beautiful heart opening conversation, and I'm, I'm excited about that. Thank you for having me, David. I'm uh, so grateful to be able to share my journey. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. And so in your bio, part of which I just uh, shared here, you talk openly about surviving pancreatic cancer. And, and I understand that that is one of the most serious variants of cancer that's out there. Uh, it's a horrible, horrible disease that you somehow managed to navigate to a place of not only of healing, but of joy. And I'm wondering if you'd like to just maybe start out and share a little bit about that journey. Yeah, I, I'd love to. I'm so grateful to be able to be here and be alive and thriving. Mm -hmm. um, I received my diagnosis of pancreatic cancer on January 4th, 2019. So we're at two months, I mean, two years and a couple months past that diagnosis. And it was a shock. I sure didn't expect that I would be having cancer in my life. Um, and when I received that, uh, it, it was the only thing I knew about pancreatic cancer was that it was very a very grim prognosis. And I didn't do a lot of research on it just for my peace of mind. Um, but one of the statistics is that in 2020, it was estimated that 60,000 people would be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and 50,000 would die from it. So very grim statistics. Right, yeah, that's like 83% mortality rate. That's just a quick calculation. I may be wrong, but I think that's that's about right. Yeah, that's that's awful. Uh, so how did you, I guess the, the question I would ask then is, given the grim prognosis, how did you maintain the kind of attitude, as we're talking about, that helped you to say, well, I'm going to be one of the one in six that, that makes it? How did you How did you navigate that, and how did you create that energy within yourself? Well, the day of my diagnosis, I was given the news by a doctor I had never met at following a procedure. And then my doctor was going to be calling me later that evening. So 
I he told me not to go down the rabbit hole and that there was hope. There was a surgery called the Whipple procedure. And I held that thought that gave my family and I so much um, hope and potential that, oh boy, wouldn't it be great if I was able to have that surgery and be able to have cancer in the rear view mirror. Right. So I, I can talk about that part of the journey as well. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> surgery of any kind is always problematic. And it's interesting to me that they kind of approach that as like a first option rather than as a second or third or final option. Uh, yeah. Were there other options presented to you as well? Yes. And so my case was borderline, um, whether mm -hmm. I would be able to have the surgery or not. And it is a surgery that requires you to be in a university type hospital. It's not a local. So people come from all over the world to go to UCSF where I had my surgery. Um, but like I said, I was borderline. Um, so where the tumor was located in my pancreas, um, it was not certain because of the involvement with the vein if I would be able to have the surgery or not. So my treatment was the standard Western medicine of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, and it, um, No, I didn't have to have radiation, oh. thankfully. Um, so I had the chemo and my tumor was um, able to shrink enough so that eight treatments into the chemo, I was able to be transferred to my surgeon at UCSF. And I had so much love and support every step of the way of my journey. You had asked me how I kept my faith and um, knowing that I had so much support and love and that I had a focus word of the year and for 2019, it was flourish. So how could I flourish? And sometimes it was just laying on the couch. Sometimes it was trying to have a sip of water. Sometimes it was having an anti-nausea pill. Um, sometimes it was just thanking God for the many blessings in my life because at every turn, my family and I were loved and supported. Um, people, prayed for me, even strangers. Um, they brought food to my family. They brought food to my husband and I. And I just felt so much love. Um, one of the things about hope is for chemotherapy, I had to have a, a port. So it is a place where they can inject the drugs directly into your veins so they don't have to go into your arm every time they do it. So that port is in my chest wall and it's still there. And <laughs> the angels whisper to me to call it Esperanza, which is Spanish for hope. Yeah, mm -hmm. And I don't speak Spanish. I'm not of Hispanic descent. And so that they gave me that name of Esperanza for hope, it was just amazing. And it was so wonderful, the synchronicities and the miracles along the way. I kept a journal, a couple of journals, and this one, I was writing about how the angels gave me the name of Esperanza. And the page that I wrote it on, it was pre-printed. Oh, yeah. This language that says hope is the conduit of miracles beautiful so, hope esperanza so that was just so loving and reassuring that yeah. okay my port is called esperanza for hope it is going to be the conduit for miracles so that when i had the chemotherapy i didn't think of it as poison going into my body mm. i felt like it was healing medicine going to the source and I would envision it to go to the location in my tumor to 
to shrink it. And my husband envisioned that it would shrink so that I didn't have to have the surgery because he beautiful. was he was afraid that I'd have to have the surgery. Um, so I had to share that about the hope and Esperanza. And another thing was during my journey, when it became apparent that I was going to be able to have the surgery, I was scared. I didn't like the word surgery. The thought of, you know, being cut open and there was a possibility I could lose my stomach. They, they take a bunch. Um, the normal procedure is they remove the head of the pancreas and take out the bile ducts and then uh, make a new bile system using part of your large intestine. So it's quite a lot um, going on there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so one night I was um, just laying in bed and I woke up with this vision that the angels wanted me to draw. And I'm not an artist, but they gave me this clear vision of a drawing to make. And they wanted me to call it my healing journey. And this gave me so much comfort. And I'll, I'll show it to you now. I also have it on my website in a blog that I wrote, um, Surviving, let's see, it's called um, The Ultimate Guide to Surviving Pancreatic Cancer in 2020. And um, this is one of the illustrations in it. But I'm not sure. How if you can see that, but there is yeah, that's great. there is a river. This right. is is called the healing stream. And on one side of the river, the beginning is the diagnosis that I received. And it's how I felt along the way, how I wanted to feel. The next step was the surgery, which I called Operation Hope instead of surgery, because the word surgery kind of grimmed me out. And okay. I just preferred to call it Operation Hope. And then at the end of my healing journey is Vibrant Health. Vibrant Health, yeah. Yeah, and so here's chemo down here. And here's the way that I felt along the way. I felt blessed. I felt blessings. I felt hope. I felt faith. I felt allowing receiving, believing, abundance, gratitude, positive thoughts, like what I could do, I could have good food, I could stay hydrated, I could rest, I could feel the energy of love. Um, and then the chemo, the thought of being supported by family and friends and receiving the love and light steeping in the goodness, trusting, surrendering, knowing, anticipating the future with so much gratitude. And at the um, surgery part, my surgeon, his middle name is Uriel, and that is an archangel. <laughs> and so I just felt like I was so blessed. And my Oncologist's first name is Michael. So I felt like Archangel Michael and Archangel Uriel were there helping me along the way. Um, an interesting part. So I had the chemo and then I had the surgery. And then it's normal protocol to go back to the oncologist and finish up your treatment um, of chemo. And I didn't want to. I had such good results from my surgery. I had clear margins. There was no um, lymph nodes involved. And my uh, cancer marker number was down really low. And so I didn't want to have chemo. Chemo was really hard for me. Um, every two weeks I would have chemo and I would start to feel good for about two days right before it was time for me to have chemo again. And so uh, by that time, I was starting to feel really good. This was August of 2019. I had had the surgery 
um, June 17th, 2019. So uh, I went for my follow-up. My oncologist was on vacation. He was going to be gone for three weeks. And so the nurse practitioner asked me, okay, Jeanette, are you ready to start chemo next week? And I'm like, no, I was hoping I wouldn't have to have chemo. And so we talked about it and she told me, you're the patient, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Um, and I talked mm -hmm. to my family mm -hmm. about it, you know, about, I didn't want to do something that long-term, you know, that would affect my long-term prognosis for a short-term gain. So I talked to my parents. My mom went to every chemo session with me and my parents went to every doctor appointment with me. So, and my sister was my press secretary and would keep everyone um, abreast of what was going on. And so that's another example of the love and support. Right. So I left that um, appointment in August thinking, I really don't want it. I said, uh, can I wait until our doctor gets back three weeks and then we can revisit the issue? So I was kind of on pins and needles for those three weeks and I was starting to feel good. My hair was starting to come in. Um, I, I was starting my taste for water came back, which water is my favorite drink. And during the chemo, I just didn't, food didn't taste right. Water tasted metallic-y and it, it just wasn't good. Um, so I was starting to feel good and I'm like, I don't want to go back for chemo, but if my oncologist says yes, I will really consider it, um, that it was necessary. And so when I saw him in September of 2019, the first thing he came in the room and it was my mom and dad and I in the room and he came in first thing he said was I recommend no more no further treatment there's no evidence of disease which they never tell you you're cancer free they say no evidence of disease and ED mm -hmm. um so I was sitting up on the exam table I'm like can I give you a hug? You know, cause we were like doing high fives. And so he said, oh yeah. So uh, there was lots of tears of joy, of gratitude, of blessings in that room. And I just felt like I was 10 feet tall leaving that appointment because I, it was another example of a miracle, right? I didn't have to have more chemotherapy and, um, I just felt so blessed every step of the way. So this is quite a story. And, you know, normally I would probably pause and interrupt to try and get some clarification. Um, but I was just enjoying listening to what you were saying. And it was really, I could feel the warmth in my heart. So it's a beautiful story. And I want to thank you so much for sharing that. And what I noticed, there's a couple of things. First, did I hear you say you got your diagnosis in June? Um, no, in January oh, of 2019. January. Right, right. So you went from January to August from, you know, first basically knowing nothing and then suddenly discovering you've got this pancreatic cancer. And by the way, can you please, just for the audience who may not know exactly, where is the pancreas? So it's right under your breastbone it's like right in the middle your liver is on the left it's part of your bile duct system and your pancreas make i don't know if you could see that but yeah that's it's right nice. between your breastbone and it's shaped like a little croissant um right. and so the, the pancreas makes your body's insulin so it's a very important organ so um regulating blood sugar and all kinds of hormones and things um so yeah, I went from not knowing anything in January to June having my surgery to August coming back um, with any possible. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's an amazing, amazing thing. And I know right now that you know 99% of the reason that you had that short a journey 
was because of your attitude. I mean, that's that's a hundred percent clear to me. And I think that, that that's really so. We we titled this thing "Cancer's Unexpected Gift," and maybe maybe that is the gift right there. Just getting the awareness of how important how important it is to maintain faith and hope and love and and as much of a positive vibe as you can, no matter what you're doing. Do you agree with that? Oh, I I agree with that totally. I think attitude is more important than health. Um, there's so many people that have okay health, but their attitude is sick. And yeah. so when something happens to them, you know, where are they gonna go? Um, they're not cultivating a healthy attitude. Um, and my son and I had this discussion uh, about six months ago about the importance of attitude in our lives, um, which when I, I thought about it, that attitude really is more important than health right. because there's so many people that are struggling with health issues, yet their attitude is pulling them through, um, making, making um, their life quality better uh, because of their positive attitude. Right. Yeah. It does make a huge difference. Now, the other question I want to ask you, so this, you said this happened in January of 2019. So that's fairly recent, like two years ago in a little bit. Yeah. Now, have you been involved in personal growth work and coaching and stuff like that prior to that date? Is that, I mean, did you learn about positive attitude even before your, your diagnosis? Is that kind of what carried you through? Yeah. Um, I've always been a pretty positive person, except for in my teen years when, um, you know, that was a pretty much of a struggle. Uh, the growing up years were pretty tough, but, um, and I've always had faith and that having that connection with the divine, I think that is so important. Um, that's one of the things I do every day, uh, my first thing is to connect with the divine in, yeah. in prayer, in devotion, in writing, you know, whatever that is, reading something inspirational. Um, so, yes, and a lot of people say cancer is their greatest gift because, you know, they, they focus on, okay, what do I want in life? You know, my time is possibly short here. What do I want? Right. Um, and like for me, the the gift of cancer was the love and support and connection that I felt from friends and strangers and family members. And it wasn't just for me. It was for my husband. It was for my parents. It was for my sister. People gave us things and prayed for us and just um, loved us in so many different ways. Yeah, it was really beautiful. Right, right. And that presence of love is something that, you know, it's probably always there. And many of us kind of take it for granted and don't always recognize love when we see it. But when you get into a situation like you've described, all of a sudden, it just shows up like flowers blooming right in front of you. It's it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and even um, during procedures at the hospital, you know, people that I didn't know giving tests to me or doing an X-ray or something, you know, I just felt like there was so much love surrounding me um, that it was a blessing you know, that I even could have the surgery and that that I was able to and that I had such good results. It's just like such a miracle and I'm just forever grateful. And so I wrote quite a bit about it. I wrote a big blog and I wrote a series of blogs about my journey with pancreatic cancer that are on my website if people want to check those out right. as well. And then um, and, and just for the record, what is your website again? Angel Angles, right? Yes, a yes, angel-angles.com. And right. it's on the blog. 
And, you know, in the blog, I also wrote about people that were surviving pancreatic cancer. And so Ruth Bader Ginsburg was um, somebody that I wrote about because she had quite a journey with pancreatic cancer and she lost her battle um, before Alex Trebek, who I wrote about him. He had stage four pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. and it had spread um, to his liver. Um, when his was diagnosed and um, when he passed away, that was really, um, it, that was really devastating because he's one of those um, icons on Jeopardy that my family and I would watch. And, you know, just that he was struggling with pancreatic cancer. Um, I just felt an affinity with him. And so when he lost his battle, it, I was sad for a while, um, but I... Well, now you talk about writing. And when I was introducing you, I mentioned your series, On a Path of Joy. Are those books the result of your journey or were they something that you wrote before? Um, there, I wrote before. I was hoping to have all seven of my books written um, in my On a Path of Joy series by my 60th birthday. <laughs> um, so in August of 2018 is when I wrote the last one. And then um, I started feeling unwell that fall. And I thought um, that I was just doing too much. I had um, right. written the four books. I had created some angel cards. My friend and I were doing um, live presentations and my mm -hmm. folks were celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. And my son was down for a visit. My dog had a torn ACL. So there was a lot going on. And I thought I was just overwhelmed and you know, just tired. But um, that was the beginning of not feeling well. And then um, when I had symptoms that I couldn't ignore, I had um, red colored urine. So that's a real trigger if anyone has that or um, different colored stools, that's something you really need to pay attention to. And um, then I saw my doctor right as right after that. And the nurse in the hospital says, oh, sometimes people go months with having red colored urine. I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, so, uh, you know, that's just a real red flag, literally a red flag. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh my God. So you got those books finished, then you got your diagnosis, and now you have a whole new journey to write about. And I, I assume that there's going to be more books coming. Is that right? Yes, I have three more in the series, and they're loosely based on the chakras. I didn't know that at the time, but when I did the first one, <clears throat> I chose blue for the cover, and that was to be seen in the world. So based on the fifth chakra, throat chakra, <clears throat> excuse me. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I went from the throat to the heart with a green healing addition, then yellow for personal power, orange for creativity. The next one is going to be red in color uh, based on being safe and protected and at one um, with the earth. And then purple um, for divine connection and indigo will be the last one in my series for intuition and inspiration. These sound great. And what, what's the series title? It's called On a Path of Joy. And oh, they yeah. are the same. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. And they're just um, each edition has a different number and a different subtitle. Um, so the last one is the orange one it's behind me here um, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, and it has a, an affirmation a, a brief devotional for the day and a beautiful photograph so and its um, size is that you can keep it at your desk at work or you can carry it in your uh, bag and um it's it's to uh be able to just tap into that 
series of tap into that inner joy and divine connection that benefits us all. Sounds beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. So the total the total series will be 12 books or, or 14? Um, well, it'll be seven, seven in the um, oh, shop. I, I thought the first part was already seven books. And <laughs> Well, um, I've done quite a few collaborations in 2020. I mm -hmm. did five collaborations, um, including some word search and some I ultimate guides, <laughs> ultimate guides to healing um, and the ultimate guide to self-care with the wellness universe that right. you and I are both involved in that book series. And right. um, yeah, so there's definitely more books coming. There's a book coming out on June 30th um, called Coffee Talk with Douglas, which is a group that I belong to. We call it a prayer group. Uh, it's loving support that we started meeting together during the pandemic um, on Zoom. Mm -hmm. My friend Douglas Ruark hosts this and we thought we'd meet for a couple weeks and then everybody would go back to work and life would return but we have grown from a group of strangers to a group of loving friends that feels like family. And we're putting together this book um, to describe our experience so that others can be motivated and have hope for the future as well. Right, yeah, that's beautiful. So we've been talking a lot about different stuff here and I think, what I'm getting is there's two, two ingredients that seem really important to you. The first is joy, and the second is hope. And can you maybe talk a little bit about which of those or how, how you might use the two of them? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to say one is better than the other, but uh, which one do you rely on most under which kinds of circumstances? Oh, boy, that's quite a question there, David. Um... I, I would say my, my hope for my general operating system is joy. That's how I want to live when I set my daily intentions. That's what I'm looking for. But that hope is something that I always want to keep an optimistic attitude. And it's... Um, I posted a beautiful quote today about hope, and I'd like to share that yeah, uh, with the audience here. And it's not my quote, it's a quote by a gal named Nikki Bannis, and it's on my um, Facebook page. And it says, if you only carry one thing throughout your entire life, let it be hope. Let it be hope that better things are always ahead. Let it be hope that you can get through even the toughest of times. Let it be hope that you are stronger than any challenge that comes your way. Let it be hope that you are exactly where you are meant to be right now and that you are on the path to where you are meant to be because during these times, hope will be the very thing that carries you through. And um, that's just um, so inspiring for me. And I, I reached out to her. She's a woman in the UK um, and she has an Instagram presence. And I asked her if I could use that quote in my ultimate guide to surviving pancreatic cancer blog. And she said, oh yes. So um, her yeah. name is Nikki Banas, N-I-K-K-I-B-A-N-A-S if anyone wants to check that out. That's that's beautiful. Yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, this is. Uh, I'm feeling a lot of optimism just speaking to you, and I and I like that that feeling in my chest. It you know kind of feels expansive, yeah. uh, an opening kind of right. feeling. Um, by the way, I want to just mention to the people who are on the live uh, presentation, if you have questions or comments you'd like to share. Please feel free to just put them in the chat and we will get to them uh, as soon as we can. Um, so let's move now to the concept of gratitude. Obviously, if you survive cancer, it sounds to me like that's something really to be grateful for. 
However, I imagine that you have an attitude of gratitude most of the time. And that's that's something that I think a lot of us could learn to cultivate. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yes, I'd love to. So for gratitude, as in hope, like there's always something to be grateful for, even if it's I'm grateful for my breath. I'm grateful for being alive. Um, Sometimes I would say when I was not feeling well, I'm grateful that there's the hope of better days ahead when I would feel better. You right. know, because feeling, feeling icky, um, and then if you didn't have the right attitude, then that, that would be like a double negative, right? Um, So I like to imagine gratitude as like steeping like a tea bag in hot water. So oh. the, the longer you sit in it, the stronger it becomes. Right. And I was looking back at um, some of these things that I had written in my um, cancer journal. Uh, I wrote a, a friend made a beautiful prayer for me and I wrote that down. Um, and I would put in messages that were uplifting to me. Um, this message came in on, it was a, a calendar, a page a day from Louise Hayes calendar on January 13th, 2019 that said, everything in my life is working out for my highest good. Out of every situation, only good will come and I am safe. And so I took that to heart that that was God giving me direction that I was going to be okay, that I was, it was going to be for my highest good. Not that it was good in that moment because it didn't feel good, right. but in, in perfect truth, it was for my highest good and that out of every situation, only good will come and I am safe. So I would focus on those things. I had mentioned how flourish was my word of the year for 2019 mm -hmm. and how can I flourish? Okay, I have control of my attitude. I, um, I don't necessarily have control of how my physical body is going to react to certain chemicals and all of that, but I do have control of how I want to move through the world. Um, yeah. so attitude and gratitude are huge. Um, so I like to do a lot of different gratitude practices and thinking, what am I grateful for in this moment before bed? What do I have to be grateful for tonight? Um, that happened today and, and that just sets you up for a good night's rest with, with having this um, gratitude for my focus word for 2021 is miracles. So every morning in my quiet time, I look at the day before and see what miracles happened in that day. And yeah. since since I'm looking for miracles, I'm finding them. And <laughs> yes, yes. And um, Einstein has the quote about miracles that you can live your life as if everything is a miracle or if nothing is a miracle. Right. And when I first heard that quote, I'm like, wow, that is amazing. And, well, and, that, and that really is um, an example of how how attitude can change things. Attitude, perspective, perception, all that stuff. They they are tied together. If you believe that everything is a miracle, you're going to approach life one way. If you believe that there's no such thing as a miracle, you're probably more pessimistic in life and you're going to approach it differently. Right. right. Yeah, it's a beautiful quote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really like that. Um, and so every day I'm looking for miracles and I'm recording them. And at the end of the year, I have a look back ceremony, a little ritual that I do. I look back um, and have this little private ceremony of 
blessing the year that was and welcoming the year ahead. And last year, my focus word was celebrate because I was celebrating the gift of my life. I was free. Yeah. Um, I was cancer free, even though the doctor doesn't say it, <laughs> um, that I was going to live my life and have a joyful existence celebrating every day. You know, we don't know if tomorrow, if we're guaranteed to live for tomorrow, but I want to enjoy today. I want to exactly. love and live and embrace the gift that is. Yeah, that's, and that's, I think that's a, a an attitude that everyone would be well advised to, uh, to adopt for themselves. You know, you were talking about this, everything works, uh, towards your highest good. And I honestly, truthfully, I, I, I believe that wholeheartedly. It's certainly a true statement for me, at least on the spiritual level. Sometimes on the physical level, it doesn't seem that way. And I know that I'll speak for myself. I have an ego mind and I'm 100% I'm sure everybody else does too, although many would, would prefer not to admit it. But if you allow your ego mind to, uh, to have control and to ha have its way, it's going to continually inject its fear-based thinking into your whatever it is you're trying to do, which will then kind of draw you away from this idea that everything is working towards your highest good. Your, your ego mind is not going to be able to believe that. So therefore, you really have to find a way to quiet the ego mind and to, you know, just say, thank you so much for your, for your warning. I got this covered. And I'm good. And so this it's a it's a, a beautiful reminder that yes, everything is working towards your highest good, towards everyone's highest good, if you simply allow it to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's also true no matter what the circumstances might look like externally. You know? I mean, you, you've talked about going through this cancer diagnosis. I've I've gone through similar situations in my life when in the moment. I would be saying to myself, oh, shit, not this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, and then I realize afterwards, okay, there's got to be a gift in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. What is the gift? And this is, this, is, this is similar to you saying, what can I be grateful for? Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. it's, it's really kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's the... Um, the attitude, the positivity, the allowing yourself. So, you know, you had talked about the ego and we all have an ego and the ego wants to keep us safe and keep us protected and all of that. Um, one of my best analogies um, about fear, the ego, is in Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic, where she talks about going on a car at a road trip and fear has to come along fear is one of the people one of the um participants in the journey but it's your choice if you're going to let fear drive or if you're going to put fear in the back seat exactly. and not pay attention to him yeah, that's and right. so i just love that when i read that i'm like oh that's so great because yeah. you know when when I do let fear drive me. It's like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. You know, that's right. um, you know, all of those kind of negative down things. Um, and, and that's not where I want to um, live my life. I, I want to mm -hmm. live at a higher, a higher um, feeling than that, a higher vibration than that as, as my, you know, default. Um, so, then it's my choice, right? So like, to me, it feels like joy, even though joy is our natural state, that we have to be radical to embrace joy. We have to be strong when the world is telling us, oh, it's the end of the world. You know, we're going to pay $10 a gallon for gas because of the politics and, you know, everybody's rioting, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's so it's like, what, what am I listening to? Kind of the, what wolf are you feeding? Kind of. Um, yep. uh, well, you're saying all my favorite metaphors here. 
Oh, okay. Aren't they great? I just love those. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and so I want to just remind people that, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with feeling fear. You're going to feel it. It's just going to happen sometime. And there's not even anything wrong with letting your ego mind run amok a little bit. The thing is, sooner or later, you have to become aware. You have to raise your awareness and say, oh, now I see what I'm doing here. And once you get to that place, then you can you know, maybe release the fear, recognize that most of your fears, probably about 98% of them are completely imaginary. They're not real. They're irrational. Um, you know, there might sometimes be something really to be afraid of. Like, yeah, you're, you're, you know, you're just about to get hit by a car or something. Yeah, that could scare you. Um, so absolutely honor your fear and even honor your ego mind. I tell people, you know, I've heard the story, uh, some of these teachers say, kill the ego. And I say, no, why would you use violence as a tool for getting rid of something? Isn't violence the opposite of love? Why not love the ego? And if you love the ego, and I mean unconditionally, then you can help it to quiet down on its own. And then it becomes your friend. And instead of being the captain of your ship, like you were just talking about, you can let it become the co-pilot or something. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, and, and that's the thing, loving it and saying, you know, Thank you for bringing this to my attention. Exactly. I, know, I know I could be hit by a car or a bolt of lightning or whatever, um, but I'm choosing not to focus on that. You know, yeah. you, can, you yeah. can go sit in the back seat for now. Right. And actually, you know, I think it's the ego mind is really trying to keep itself safe. It doesn't really care whether I'm safe or not. It wants to keep itself safe. Mm -hmm. You know, I just happen to be the vehicle that carries this ego mind around. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it's kind of fun to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. We've talked a lot about some good stuff here. And I really want to focus in on one area that I think is very important. And that is the whole concept of a healing attitude. Now, we've kind of touched on various different aspects of it. Um, I mean, I think everybody, everybody, whether you have the, the, the misfortune of, of going through a cancer diagnosis or not, everybody has to heal something in his or her life. Now, most of us have, you know, maybe psychological or spiritual issues that we need to deal with more so than the physical. I mean, I think that's universally true. And so we have to bring the right kind of attitude towards our healing. And that means focusing unconditional love on ourselves. How do you go about creating that? And how do you encourage your clients for doing that? Well, I like to keep a picture of me at five years old as mm -hmm. an inner child and love that inner Jeanette because we all have this inner child within us that only wants our love and attention and approval and so if we can look at our eye uh, at that part of our life with love and compassion then we can get through anything you know seeing oh my my inner child is afraid she doesn't want to get up on stage and do this or um, she doesn't want to look silly or whatever, you know, whatever that is, just to embrace that sense of childlike wonder and discovery that's within us all that, that wants this love and attention. Right. Yeah, beautiful. And I, I totally agree with the whole inner child concept. I've done a lot of work on that myself. Um, and I think that's something that if more people would uh, focus attention on the inner child, we'd have a lot less difficulty in the world. I really believe mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. you know, yes. because then egos can be tamed. When you, when you love your inner child, it's interesting to me that my, my ego often shows up like a little boy, an angry little boy sometimes. And so maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's my inner child just acting out. Uh, yeah. So maybe we can learn from that and, and just begin to do the work, you know, love that inner child. 
Yeah. Maybe it yeah. didn't get the kind of love that it wanted or needed when it was actually, when you were actually five or six years old or whatever, for whatever yeah. reason. This is not to make parents wrong or anything. Parents all, I believe, most anyway, do the absolute best they can and they come from a place of love. But we're human beings, for God's sakes. We make mm -hmm. mistakes. I've made yeah. mistakes with my kids. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so. we all do. Um, and and that is just so true. So, you know, maybe today you want to consider yourself um, to have a favorite lunch or favorite snack from your childhood as honoring your inner child, just to, to oh, increase that idea. awareness. What a yeah. great idea. I hadn't even yeah. thought of that one. Yeah. Now I have to think, what was my favorite snack as a kid? Yeah. So like, you know, do you like peanut butter and jelly on white bread with the crust cut off or a grilled <laughs> cheese sandwich and tomato soup, you know, whatever it is, oh, yeah. um, or a favorite candy, you know, it was just Easter. And that was one of the questions I said, what, what's your favorite Easter candy? And some people like peeps and, um, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups or whatever, you know, we all have our special little treat. So, yeah. um, I like to encourage people to treat themselves uh, because we often are like, no, I can't, I shouldn't, whatever, but- I'm gonna get you know, fat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, treat yourself to that little um, delight and one today. Oh yeah, today. absolutely. And you know, treating yourself doesn't have to involve food either. Right. Maybe, maybe, you know, if you want to have fun with your little child, maybe it's just about building a, a fort in your living room with, yeah. you know, turn the furniture on its side, put put blankets up and get underneath yeah. your fort with your with your exactly. pet dog or whatever and pretend you're on an adventure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Go in that little fort and read a favorite childhood story or take yourself to the park and go down the slide or swing, you know, whatever that thing Go out and play in nature. Those That's are all a, wonderful. These are some great ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I want to get to your angel angles. Uh, your, your main focus has been around uh, angels and angel cards. And you talked about the two of your doctors, one being called Uriel and the other one, uh, uh, Michael. Michael. Mm -hmm. And uh, how in your mind, that was like having two archangels supporting you through this journey. So talk a little bit about the power of angels and, and how that's so important to you. Well, um, it mostly started when my brother was ill and failing from a brain tumor. Um, and I found a woman on Facebook. I grew up in the church, so I always had faith. But I found a woman on Facebook that her words were so soothing and it was like a healing balm to my soul. And she was talking about the angels love and I knew about angels, but I thought, oh, they only, you know, would deal with saints and uh, prophets and, you know, people, holy people, not regular people like Jeanette. Um, Yet, I, I got so much comfort and love from, from her healing words. And after my brother passed away, um, I always felt like he was kind of guiding me. We were very close. And um, when I, I was thinking of what I was going to do in retirement, and I wanted to do the work of my soul, and I wanted to do writing, and um, I had an angel session with this woman, Laurel Bleeding Maffei of Illuminating Souls. And I didn't know what to expect with it. You know, I didn't know if I was going to start seeing dead people or if it would affect my faith. But it only drew me deeper and closer into my um, faith with the divine. And it was so beautiful and soothing. And so six months after having my first angel session with her, I was looking at how can I do this kind of work for others? And then um, I became a certified angel card reader and I read everything I could find about angels. They fascinated me. When I was a kid, I saw little people um, 
like little fairies on my floor. And I told my mom and she said, oh no, that's your imagination. And then I thought, oh, okay, it's my imagination. So I didn't think about them anymore. Um, but looking back, I'm like, oh, they were making their presence known. You know, and some of us just feel a real affinity like out in nature, um, connecting to the divine. There's like so much um, energy in the power of being next to the ocean or a river, you know, those kind of things that spark your uh, divine curiosity. Um, so it's, it's, I, I think it's kind of funny. I mean, I remember my own, my daughter had this imaginary friend <laughs> and uh, I don't know, you know, to her, it was just somebody who showed up and I remember hearing from my mom, well, oh, that's just your imagination. So I tried not to say that to my daughter. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would just say to her, this is interesting. I mean, I can't see, uh, what was the, Pawnee. Pawnee was the name of this, this, Pawnee. yeah, Pawnee. Pawnee Lawson, where that name came from, I have no idea, but that's what she called it. And I said, I'm afraid I can't see or hear Pawnee. I think it's because I'm too old or something like that. Yeah. I said, so maybe you can tell me what's going on. <laughs> so, awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, I yeah. Thought, I'm going to just indulge this for a while. It's going to go away. I mean, she's, if it really is just an imaginary thing, then it's going to, it's going to go away. And if it's something real, then it's going to feel real to her. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and that is quite normal. Um, so many kids have, um, the imaginary friends or, right. you know, people, little people or, you know, a, a loved one that has passed on that they can maintain um, a contact with. Uh, I think I didn't have an imaginary friend because I had a brother that was, we were 17 months apart. So we were, you know, he was always with me. <laughs> so right. I had yeah, a built-in yeah. friend. Yeah, I had a built-in friend. Yeah. Oh, this has been great, and um, and I love the fact that you're involved in this work with with angels, and uh, uh, I think it's awesome. I think it's awesome. I, I I will admit that for much part a large part of my life, I didn't really buy into that stuff, and uh, but now I've met many people, adults that I respect, and I and they're telling me about these angels. I'm thinking. Maybe I ought to pay more attention to this stuff, you know? Maybe I ought to just learn a little bit instead of being, you know, this closed-minded thing. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, angels are mentioned in all the um, sacred religious texts. Um, so yeah. it's not just like, you know, only Christian or whatever. It's, it's right. across the board um, as far as, you know, recorded um, texts go. So. Yeah. Well, Jeanette, we're getting close to the end of our time here. Uh, I Wow, it's, it's just flown by. It's been an amazing conversation. I want to thank you so much for everything you've shared so far. And I'm wondering uh, if there's anything you'd like to share to close out. And I know you mentioned at, before we started that uh, you had some kind of a, um, a session or a webinar or something like that coming up. Yes, um, my friend Pam Vulcan and I are hosting a free online event called Holistic Healing and Happiness Summit, and it is going to be May 1st through 7th. We have 13 expert presenters, and we have topics from creativity to um, sound bath meditations to Akashic Records to joy um a shamanic journey um getting better with age and so we have lots of cool things coming up i'm putting the link um here in the chat and it's called holistic healing and happiness summit and we're going to be starting the promotion later this week um, it'll be on my website and it'll be in David's show notes for this episode for those of you that are watching the recording. And yeah, I'm, not, happy seeing, on. I'm not seeing the link showing up in the chat. Oh, there it is now. Now it's got, now I see it. Now, just out of curiosity, um, are, is there going to be a recording of this session? So it, 
And yes. if I see people this link, will it take them to the recording if they miss the live session? Um, so it will take them to a landing page that they'll sign up for the event, and then we will email them the um, links, and there will be a replay. We don't have the exact date of the replay when that'll happen, so they'll have to please stand by for that. That's a little fluid at this moment. Right. Well, the reason I'm asking is I'd like to be able to put this link right on my website. Um, and it, that means that, what, you know, a couple of months from now, when people come back and watch this show, they'll still be able to click on that same link and go to the recording. That's what I'm. Yeah. 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 All right. I great. We'll keep it up there for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Well, that's, it's been awesome, Jeanette. It's just been great having you here. I've just enjoyed so much learning about you know, some of your journey and some of the things that you have taken away from, from your journey. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I, I um, am so grateful to be able to come and to give people hope for the future if they are facing a scary diagnosis like cancer. So yeah, thank you, great. David. <laughs> All right, and thank you all for watching today's program, whether you're here live or whether you're watching the recording. And I just want to remind people, you can catch recordings of this and every one of my episodes on my website at lifemasterytv.com. That's life-mastery-tv.com. Um, I truly hope you enjoyed this presentation. In a few hours, you're going to receive an email from the Learn It Live folks asking for uh, some feedback. My request is that you take some time to maybe write a little review for us and uh, help us to spread the word about Life Mastery and Life Mastery TV and stuff. So I'd really appreciate that. And finally, I just want to remind people about the practice of what I call the Life Mastery Mantra. And I'm going to share it with you now so you can take it with you into your week. It goes like this. I gratefully forgive the imperfect being I have been in the past. I gratefully accept the magnificent being I am right now. I gratefully welcome the evolved being I am becoming in each new moment. So until we meet again, I'm again, my name again is David McLeod. I am your Life Mastery Coach, wishing you love, light, and blessings on your continuing journey. See you all next time.